Times are tough in cities like Warwick. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you at part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. Welcome in. You know, I say those things and I'm not sure that people in Warwick even know. Uh, you'd have to be living under a rock. But a lot of people dwell under the rock. Uh, Bob Cushman is a former city councilor and school committeeman in Warwick a decade plus ago. Uh, but he has been kind of on a, uh, a tour, if you will, of... Uh, I don't know, providing information on the deficits that the city of Warwick is facing. And, you know, he was, he was often chided by the status quo when he was elected for being kind of this goofy numbers guy. Uh, he's not goofy, and he is a numbers guy. And uh, there's nothing wrong with being a numbers guy. In fact, if we're all better numbers people, uh, we'd keep track of the numbers, wouldn't we? Anyway, we're going to get into it in depth and quickly here uh, in a couple of minutes. It is a pleasure to have you aboard. Thank you very much for tuning in. This was interesting today. Uh, headline, Massachusetts is wooing Hasbro, uh, according to the Providence Journal. And Governor Raimondo was on WPRO radio this morning uh, with uh, Gene Valicente and said, uh, uh, boy, oh boy, I, I couldn't believe she said this. My job is the chief executive of the state. It is my job to make sure they stay in Rhode Island. Um, and the mayor, of course, is focused on keeping them in Pawtucket. I think what's in the best interest of the mayor is to make the positive case for Pawtucket, not necessarily to have press conferences criticizing the company. Like, Hasbro is a great company. They're a great corporate citizen, and we want to keep them in Rhode Island. We had a news conference being critical of the company, and that isn't what we want to be doing right now. What we want to be saying is this is a great company with a long history. Rhode Island can fulfill their business needs. We have great talent, great location, great place to live. You started here. You belong here. Stay here. We're going to partner with you. I mean, businesses want a partner in government. They don't want an adversary. And so, you know, that's what I'm trying to say to all businesses, right. by the way, big and small. We're going to partner with you and help you to be successful. Uh, that, that is terrible. It's terrible on the part of the governor to suggest that Mayor Grebian criticized Hasbro. He did like heck. I remember this press conference. And... I have his notes. I just had them sent to me. Uh, Mayor Grebian recognized every, this is after the Paw Sox announced they were leaving, uh, recognized Hasbro officials at the governor and commerce that they were putting a package together for Hasbro to stay in Pawtucket. Uh, he said that there was urgent action that the state needed to take on uh, to protect Hasbro jobs and their identity in Pawtucket. He mentions that he spoke with the executive vice president of global affairs at Hasbro on the day of that press conference. Uh, and he notes that the vice president reaffirmed their commitment to meet with the city and state officials. He did not criticize Hasbro. Hasbro reportedly was offended that Hasbro was mentioned. Uh, this is like the telephone game. Somebody says something and says something that's not true, and then somebody else picks up and they elaborate on it and, says and tells the next person that's not true. The governor is playing a telephone game with one of the most important deals this state has ever seen, meaning the potential that Hasbro could leave this state, and she's already setting the table. This is what, you know, she's really offended about Donald Trump. She doesn't like Donald Trump. This is a Trumpian move. This is, hey, guess what? Don Grebian set a bad precedent, so if we lose Hasbro, it's about Don Grebian. That's awful. That's terrible. That's what Donald Trump does with Bob Mueller. Oh, he's a bad guy. I'll tell you, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a Democrat. He isn't. His people are all Democrats. I said, if that report's not so... That's exactly what Donald Trump does. Wow. It's not right. I'm telling you, it's not right. Uh, hospital issues were the ongoing conversations. I'm looking to get the, the folks from Lifespan in here as soon as possible. Uh, Dr. Babineau, the president and CEO of Lifespan, was on with me on the radio on Friday. 
You know, we've had uh, the CEOs of both companies on the radio show on WPRO weekdays 3 to 6, and we did have already one show with the Care New England folks. You know, we've got this big to-do going on between those two entities as Care New England is marrying up with the folks in Boston uh, with partners and Brigham and Women's and Mass General. Uh, this headline, uh, Kev, can we put that up again? Because I just want to see, I want, I want people to see this. This came out this weekend, good journalistic work by Ted Nisi. Uh, he, got a, he got a hold of some of the paperwork that's already been uh, filed with the state on this merger, and it really is, ha I'm sorry, it, it, it's, it's lifespan, a uh, holding Karen and Winkland kind of uh, with a figurative gun to their temple that they'll do something if they uh, uh, partner up with partners in Massachusetts because the lease for women and infants, you know, that's on the uh, lifespan property, the Rhode Island Hospital property. That, that reportedly they can't change ownership, you know, with the lease. It's a sticky wicket, and it does not, by the way, represent the sentiment that Dr. Babineau offered on my radio program Friday. And there was a real concern that this was probably the biggest health care transaction this state will see, at least as long as I've been here, and that the implications of the transaction were, were far-reaching. So the board felt very strongly, and, and I concurred, that um, we needed to draw some attention to this and to make sure that the community understood what the details of the, tra of the proposed transaction were, what we believe some of the un unintended consequences may be. It's intended to educate the community on the implications of the transaction if it moves forward as a standalone transaction, number one, to get some public discourse going uh, around the transaction and what it could mean to get state leaders to pay attention to it, and, and just to get the community to come out. Look, if, if at the end of the day, the community educates itself, they learn the facts, they go to the website, they understand what it means, and the community says, you know what, uh, we're okay with this. Well, uh, while I would disagree with that decision, we will at least feel like we've done our job in educating the public. That's really what this is all about. I had a good working session with Dr. Babineau and two of his outstanding uh, directors of, of cardiac uh, surgery and neurosurgery. They're at the top of their game. But I'll tell you, by the time I was done with Dr. Babineau, he was not disputing that they're actually trying to bust this deal up. He didn't say it. I said it. He didn't dispute it. Uh, this particular lease story that Ted finds shows that they're willing to bust this deal up. So stay tuned for uh, the details on that, and we're going to follow up and uh, continue with this on both the radio and television shows here. In the meantime, uh, part of the story that we're going to discuss tonight, here's a headline. The House okayed the Evergreen contract bill, as it's known, uh, a while back. The Senate is still taking a look at it. The governor spoke about that, too, on WPRO this morning. This time I'm leaning towards signing that one, but again, leaning, haven't decided, have to review it, have to see what comes out of the Senate, have to talk to the mayors, but it is a different bill than last time. Um, it's narrower this time. We actually listened to feedback from municipal leaders and worked with the House to change it. Eh, not much. You know, we've had three or four shows on this even here, not much. Bob Cushman is a former city councilor of Warwick. I, I, I don't see much difference in, in, in the new version of this. This What this does, by the way, welcome. Good to see you. Thank you. Good to see you. The, the, the contract, uh, the bill, rather, just perpetuates a current contract that a city has with a bargaining unit, uh, teachers, as an example. So all the, all the terms of the agreement remain intact until a new agreement is negotiated, yep. and the municipal officials are saying it takes away a lot of our bargaining you know, power. You know what I find so absurd about the argument? Everybody used the buzzword, level the playing field. How do you level the playing field when you have to negotiate basically with a monopoly, a one service provider, right? You can't do that. So like I was thinking of an example. You Who's know? the monopoly? It's the municipal unions. It's the unions. It's you know. So for example, hmm. I like to do comparisons. So, so let's say you had lawn service, right? Genus lawn service, right? You're looking at ah, oh, boy, this doesn't look too good. My lawn's in terrible condition. I think maybe I'll go to Bob's lawn service because he's got some new techniques and things like that. So imagine when you sign that contract with Gina that you cannot get out of that contract, right? So next year comes around and say, you know, I think I might want to go contract with Bob. He's doing some new techniques, some new things. Mm. And Gina says, you know, you can't do that. So I say to Gina, hey, Gina, you know what? Can you do these new techniques? You know, I, I, I think they're really spiffy. They can really make the lawn look pretty good. And she goes, yeah, I could do that, but it's going to cost you 50% more. 
So the situation we're getting into right now is you can't level the playing field because you're negotiating on a monopoly. If, if the governor... Yeah, because with your analogy, there's no option to go see Bob. Absolutely not. Or if you want to go see Bob or get the same terms with Gina, she's going to say, okay, well, you know what, I need. it's going to cost you 50% more. Unless you have some major levers that you want to exercise, which nobody wants to, and we'll talk about that, and we're going to dig into the specific problems for the city of Warwick in this. Stay with us. So this is you uh, at the board explaining to people that even if the city of Warwick uh, does the maximum tax increase for the next five years, it still faces a near $80 million deficit combined between schools and, and the town, right? Yeah, a lot of red on that chalk. That is, that is really, really hard. Uh, you can weave in the evergreen contract conversation along with this. I know you've got some charts, and you got to have a big screen to look at this stuff, but at least you know we're doing the work, right? And they're very colorful. <laughs> uh, these, are, these are charts you made, correct? Yes, yeah, it's, uh, it's based on you actual... You wanted to start with the, 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 the teacher or the school one, because that really okay. dovetails from the evergreen conversation mm -hmm. that we were talking about. By the way, you have any indication as to why your mayor in Warwick was the only mayor who didn't show up amongst other mayors who were asking for mercy from the governor to, to reject he this contract? Absolutely should have been Bill? there. Bill? I have no idea why, but he, I think someone, if he couldn't be there, he had another commitment, his chief of staff, someone should have been there. Someone should have represented the city of Warwick, especially with all this going on. Okay, so show me the first chart and, and tell me what it means. Well, so are we looking at the, the school budget? Well, so it, basically what we're looking at is, I think the most important points to look at is, look at the, the green line, that's a per student cost from 2004 to 2019 now, you know, 15 years ago, $11,300 per student. Now we're up to well, over 19000 Now when we look at the red line, the red line is student enrollment. It's decreased by almost 30% from 12,000 students to 8,800. And then when we look at the number of employees, I only had the data from 2011, that's kind of like that purple line. Mm -hmm. We've cut uh, uh, positions by 234 positions. So the, the, the question is, is why would a stu school department decreasing enrollment, right, decreasing employment, is the uh, per student cost continuing to go higher? And what is the answer? Come on well, back it's, it's basically because of all these inefficient things locked into the contracts that you can't get rid of. Like? Uh, you know, well, years ago, in 2016, we had something called waiting in the Warwick school system where you would wait a student maybe as one and a half students, two students. It was something that nobody else ever used inside the, in, in, within the entire state or the region. And the, in 2016, the school department unilaterally got rid of that. This is one of the things that's driving the Evergreen contract um, uh, legislation because what they basically said, we have a major financial problem, we can't do this anymore, there's better techniques to do this, kind of like when I was talking about the Gina, you know, lawn care. And they unilaterally said, we're not going by the existing terms of the contract, and they wanted to eliminate that. They had a, a layoff provision where you can only lay off 20 teachers. They didn't go by that because you were closing schools. You're closing three, four, five schools down. So the thing is, you needed some kind of relief from these contract contractual languages that were tying you into 20 layoffs per year, which was negotiated 30, 40 years ago. It's never, you've never been able to get rid of it. So the school department basically said, look, we can't operate this way. We need to eliminate additional positions or maybe through attrition or whatever. What this evergreen contract language is going to do, it's totally going to destroy the ability of the cities and towns to maybe remove some of that uh, language in the contracts or other things that are going to continue to drive up the cost. Well, the people who argue for it say, well, that all can be handled at the bargaining table. Yeah, and what happens is, let's look at Mayor Avedesian years ago was the crisis of the moment, right? So what, what did he do? And if your list is not aware of this, he backfilled contracts. So if I needed to get relief this year, you're only thinking about this year. You're not thinking about the future. I'll give you, you know, deferred compensation, deferred holidays, things on the back end of the contracts when you retire. And there's another great slide we can show, like the municipal budget trends, okay. where basically if you take a look at in 2004, 19% of the budget was retired employee benefits, right? And then you go to 2019, 28%. The last chart shows you the cumulative money, $55 million we gave to the city over the last 15 years. 43% of that went to retired employee benefits. This is all that back end stuff. Not only the pensions and the health care, but all this other kinds of things that we're talking about that you really don't want to pay attention well, well, to it, today. It seems like 
in fact, uh, Kevin, I'm going I'm to throw something at you. Can you roll uh, the Steve Marola um, um, audio there? Because this is kind of an important thing on the subject that we're talking about. You say we believe larger payments would be desirable independent of the accounting requirements. We have discussed this with the city staff in prior years, and we have been told the city's budget could not accommodate this. Right? Yes. So we can't afford to put more money in. It's not that we shouldn't. So on that, uh, that was in 2011. Yeah. Steve's been here to talk about, hey, listen, I tried back then. Uh, he now is the president of the city council. And I think that's a good thing for the taxpayers. He'll, 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 he'll do what he can to, uh, to work with Mayor Solomon, who I cannot figure out from the day. I, I, I can't figure out. He was, he was really, really easy around Scott Abadesian. Then all of a sudden, he decided to blame everything on Scott Abadesian. And he won't come here because I called him out on a lie that he told me on a radio show. And, you know, he's, he's a weird dude, man. But, uh, Mayor, you can come here anytime. Anytime you want, but the thing here is, when you, I don't know if these uh, these graphs show it, but it almost looks like it's about half the doggone budget in the city of Warwick is legacy costs, meaning it pays for people who used to work for the city. So, so on, you am know, I right about yeah, that? Yeah, well, on, on the city side, so we look at that 15 year spending, yeah. and so I like, I'll throw that up again, Kevin. I, I chance, like to say you. this example: like if you're a small business, and for every new dollar you earned from, you know, in profits. 43% of that dollar had to go to pay for employees that used to do the work that no longer are employed for you. You would close up shop. You would go bankrupt. Mm -hmm. That's what's happened in City Warwick. And that clip that you basically you just played right now, we're not even putting enough money into the retirement and benefits. So we really should be putting more into it. So, you know, it, there's a point in time where, you know, you're already not fixing your roads. You're not fixing your schools. You know, we had a major... A uh, problem in, in one of the roads on Sandy Lane that closed down traffic and things like that. There's no money to do anything else except for these benefits. And you know, I talked about six former uh, uh, firefighters, and I'm not picking on anybody, but over the entire career, they put 750,000 to the pension plan, and we give 3% automatic colas no matter what. It doesn't matter how the, the financial situation is. In 20 years, they're going to pull 11 million dollars out of that pension plan. So, so that's the kind of thing that we're looking at. That yeah. is unsustainable. By the way, the $78 million deficit over five years, uh, meaning that in five years it'll be $78 million, correct? Yeah. That does not speak to the pension and OPEP benefits. If you did, we. OPEP being other post employment benefits, meaning health care. That's above and beyond I, to the tune of. Well, so, hundreds of so millions it's kind of, of funny, you know, Ken Block going up like a couple of weeks, he said, Bob, what would, what would the deficit be if you actually made your OPEP payments? It would be $190 million. And I just want your viewers to know, you know, 190 over five years, it's just impossible. It can't be done. But a maximum tax increase, we can raise about 8 to $9 million. I mean, we're talking about deficits now, like I think the mayor said $18 million in the 2020 budget that starts July 1st. So we're at a point in time that, with a double maximum tax increase, you're not going to be able to, you know, meet these obligations. So, let's talk about this for a second. You know, the mayor said we're not going to go over the four percent tax. There's a state law you can't tax higher than four percent. You have the evergreen legislation coming in. How are you going to figure this out? I mean, I, I look at the numbers and things like that. To me, it almost looks like it's impossible. And, and I kind of said, you know, on your radio show, did they find a pot of gold somewhere? Because I, I don't see how you can come up with this this stuff. You know, how are you going to be able to balance your budgets? So maybe we'll just hypothesize as to what you do next. Next. Okay, so the proposed work school budget increase draws fire. Uh, well, you know, there should be a lot more than that drawn fire in the city of Warwick right now. Um, w w without developing the solution here and say can you just talk to me about what I said at the top of the show is the general population of work aware of what's happening in their town I don't I don't I think they're aware if you have students in the school system you could see how services you know probably aren't up to the level or, or even the the school environment you could see we got rundown schools we got repairs that were having taking place I think you know, people when they go to the recreation facilities and they see they're pretty shoddy, the beaches and things like that, the roads aren't being repaired. I think people could see that. I don't think sometimes people put two and two together. 
to see, well, what's the effect? What's, I mean, what's the cause of this thing? But, you know, something happened now. There's a tsunami happening, I think, in Warwick right now. We just hit the sweet spot with the revals. The people in the two hundred to three hundred thousand dollar home range are getting whacked. Their houses are going up by forty, fifty thousand dollars, which is multiplied by the rate, which is going to increase their property. Yeah. Tax. So when you're talking about a maximum tax increase, you, these people are going to get walloped. Now, you know, when you do a reval, one third gets a tax increase, one third stays the same, and one third gets a reduction. These people are in the one third. So even if we didn't raise taxes, let's say we were a great run city, you're still going to get a tax increase because your property taxes went up higher than anybody else's. Right? Because value went up. The value went up. So when you stop putting maximum tax increases, uh, one year, two year, three years, I mean, this is going to, you know, maybe it's going to cause people to uh, get out and 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 start demanding some kind of changes. You know? Well, this the solution ends up being the only way you can go above a four percent increase on the previous year's tax levy is for the General Assembly to give you a waiver. Yeah. Uh, does Solomon end he, up going for that? Well, he said no, he's not going to do that. So, so where's the money coming well, from? Well, you know, that's the question. I mean, is the, it is it this this stick that? The unions seem to be baiting municipal leaders to use, and that is to lay people off in mass quantities. You know, that might be the thing that has to happen, but, you know, unfortunately, there's consequences to that. So I just heard that the school department asked for a 1% give back from the teachers. You know, they're asking for, you know, you have math intervention, people getting laid off, they're getting removed, and, and the union won't give back anything. So, you know, I think on the city side and school side, you know, what's the answer? So. Maybe we don't collect garbage every week, right? It's every other week because we need to cut our... But our, that's not going to get to it. No, I, it's not. But, you know, you're boxing people into such a point. Like when we look at the, the school department budget, 73% of the budget, 71% is active employee costs. That means you've got to go after the people that are working right now. On the city side, you've got to go after the retirement benefits. You know, so if you're locking in the, the tools and, and w what are you going to do? You've got to balance your budget, right? So you're going to end up cutting current services even more. You know, so does, do the unions want their brothers and sisters to be laid off? That's what it sounds like, right? You know, if you're, if you're coming over and say, well, you know, you can still lay people off. Why don't we get more efficient, right? Why, don't, why doesn't Gina and the rest of the General Assembly talk about doing things on a statewide basis to make the cities and towns more efficient? Mandate that, right? You know, central dispatch. We have, we have police and fire dispatch in Warwick. Why? Why can't we just have dispatch? Why can't we have East Greenwich and West Warwick share that dispatch? You know, we have all this... There are communities that are making those moves. Yeah, but, but you know what? The General Assembly won't take that up. You want to level the playing field? Why don't you level the playing field for the kids and for the elderly in these cities and towns? We'll leave it with hypothetical questions. Don't be a stranger. We'll, uh, we'll keep in touch. It's not just Warwick, by the way. Bob, thank you. Thank you. Every city and town needs a Cushman, a Cody, those types. Final word when we come back. Mr. Cushman asked some questions that we don't have answers to, but I can tell you that our General Assembly is handcuffing cities and towns right now and just creating momentum the taxpayers are not going to be able to recover from if they have to, if we have to. And usually to a person, when you ask them if they know what's going on, other than you, if you watch this show, or if you listen to the radio weekdays 3 to 6 on WPRO, good night.